Will you be in prayer with me, friends? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds to your good news today and every day. Amen. As Stephen mentioned, today we continue our series, Tales from the Script, with another bizarre and disturbing tale from the Bible befitting an October reading. This tale, unlike last week's story of the seven sons of Sceva, is widely known both in and outside of the church. In an episode of Seinfeld, meant to emulate today's Bible reading, Elaine and Kramer argue over who rightfully owns a bicycle. They agree to have their neighbor, Newman, preside over their case as they make their arguments for ownership to this unconventional judge. In the end, Newman declares that the solution is to cut the bike in half so that each party can have half. Elaine begrudgingly agrees to Newman's decision, but Kramer refuses to see the bike destroyed, so he forfeits his right to half the bike so that the bike stays in one piece, surrendering it to Elaine. At this, Newman appoints that Kramer is the rightful owner because only the rightful owner of the bicycle wouldn't want it to be destroyed. Another modern cultural connection to this biblical story is the somewhat common expression of splitting the baby. Have you ever heard that? No? Maybe not as common as I thought. It's actually often used in legal disputes. Lawyers use that term when negotiating uh, legal disputes where compromise is required because determining the truth of the matter proves to be too difficult. It's a he said, she said, or she said, she said. But the pop cultural reference to this story that I find most exciting is found in an episode of The Simpsons. Like you are right now, Homer Simpson sat in church one Sunday morning listening to the ongoing droning of Reverend Lovejoy's sermon, and he couldn't help but drift off to sleep. While asleep, Homer dreamed himself into some of the biblical stories shared in Lovejoy's sermon, including King Solomon. Let's take a look, shall we? I'll stop. King Solomon, these men need you to settle a dispute. They each claim ownership of this pie. Hmm. The pie shall be cut in two. And each man shall receive death. <gasps> I'll eat the pie. Mm. You gotta love the Simpsons, right? There you have it. A biblical judgment so profound that it reverberated all the way to the mythical town of Springfield. And I think that is an important detail to know about this story, the mythical nature of it. The story is commonly viewed in scholarship as an instance or a reworking of a folk tale. Specifically, it's classified on the Arn Thompson Uther Index of Folk Tales. Yes, there is a classification system for folk tales that's been around for over a century. And within this system, it's classified in the genre of clever acts and words. German Old Testament scholar Hugo Gressman found 22 similar stories in world folklore and literature, especially in India and the Far East some from before the time of the bi biblical text and some after. One Indian version is a story dealing with Buddha and one of his previous incarnations as the sage Mahasoda, who arbitrates between a mother and a yakshina, a feminine nature spirit who is in the shape of a woman. The yakshina kidnapped the mother's baby and claimed he was hers. When brought before this wise sage, the sage announced a tug of war. He drew a line in the dirt and asked one woman to hold the feet of the child and another woman to hold the hands and declare that whoever pulled the baby, the full body of the baby across the line was indeed the rightful mother. Well, the mother, as soon as this tug of war began, saw how much the child suffered immediately, let go of the child releasing him to the other woman. 
the Yakshina took the baby while this mother wept at her loss. And when the sage saw the woman who was grieving, he turned the baby back to the hands of the true mother and exposed the identity of the Yakshina and expelled her from their midst. That is just one version of the 22 folk tales found by Gressman in ancient folk literature that match the Solomon story. The common motif in those different parallels is that the wise judge announces an absurd procedure, which is reasonable, appears reasonable in some perverse way to those who are present on that day. Splitting the baby according to the principles of compromise or a tug of war in which one can supposedly assume that the harder you pull, the more you love that child. But this procedure, all of these procedures in these folk tales are actually a concealed emotional test designed to force each woman to decide whether her compassion for the baby overpowers her will to win. But what do we make of this motif in light of the Solomon example? Let's back up to the first part of 1 Kings chapter 3 to see what had happened prior to this story in question. At the end of chapter 2, King David, Solomon's father, had just died and appointed his son Solomon to be his successor on the throne of Israel. Solomon, in response, traveled to Gibeon to make a sacrifice to God as sort of preparation for his time on the throne. And there at Gibeon, Solomon fell asleep and had a dream. And in that dream, God came to Solomon and asked, Solomon, ask me for anything that you want. And Solomon said, well, gosh, my dad was king, so I pretty much got everything I've ever wanted. Uh, I've got riches. I've got good health. I'm young because Solomon was still a kid at the time that he became king. I've got everything I could ever ask for. But you know what? Maybe because my life has been so easy and handed to me on a silver platter, maybe I don't have good wisdom, the ability to make good choices. So how about wisdom? How about a discerning mind so that I might make good choices, able to discern between good and evil for who can govern this great people of yours, O God? At this request, God in this dream was so pleased with Solomon. God said, you could have asked for riches or long life or for me to kill your enemies, but because you asked for wisdom, I will give you this discerning mind that you seek. Then Solomon woke up and realized it was only a dream. However, the very next verse in, second, in 1 Kings chapter 3 is the beginning of today's reading, using that word later. Later, this is what happened, the story says. Making a transition from Solomon's request for discernment, for wisdom, to this story. It isn't hard to see that the author is tying Solomon's dream request to this tale as an example of the incredible wisdom Solomon received to God, proclaiming that it was indeed much more than just a dream. Now, before we begin to unpack the decision made by Solomon, let's take a look at the details of the story. Professor Elna Solving reminds us that in the Bible, one measure of justice in the land is how the most vulnerable in society are treated. Typically, the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Following the example of God who executes justice for the orphan and the widow who loves the strangers... That is what is considered to be justice. The first Kings 3 narrative introduces two women who were prostitutes. The Bible loves to call women prostitutes, don't they? Both new mothers, in this case it probably is true. <laughs> Both new mothers residing together in the same house. The women are clearly on their own, fending for themselves economically, each with a brand new human to care for. And together we're invited to consider what measure of justice for these two vulnerable members of society will we find here in this story. 
The details of what happened or what might have happened emerged in the appeal of one woman, the scripture calls her, directly to Solomon. And then the denial is raised by the other woman. One woman and the other woman. That's what these women are called. And in her appeal, the one woman refers to the other woman as this woman, and the one woman asserts that this woman was the woman who was, took the baby from the one woman. She lay on her infant son, the scriptures tell us, according to the accusation of the one woman. During the night, and this baby died, placing her dead son at the breast of the other woman who took this one woman's living son. When she woke in the morning, she realized what had happened. Knowing that her child was alive, she went to the king to argue her case. And obviously what Stephen read for us is what happens there as the two women stand and argue before the king. Who is the rightful mother of this child? Neither woman wanting to face the loss of a child. The two women are divided over who is the mother. And they have no standing in the court. No wise counsel because they are alone in this world. And so alone they plead their case before the king. Bring me my sword so I can divide the baby in two and give half to each of these women. That is the grand idea that Solomon comes up with as he hears the testimony. Before the sword can be drawn, however, scripture tells us that compassion for her son burned within the one woman. And she cried out, no, please, my Lord, give the child to this other woman. Please do not kill him. The other woman says, do it, king. Cut the boy. Make it so that he's neither mine nor hers. From this, Solomon, and well, anyone really, could tell who is the rightful mother. And she was declared the parent before the king. The concluding message, the last verse in this passage, passage says, All Israel heard of the judgment of Solomon and were in awe because the wisdom of God was given to him to execute justice. Now, I don't know how you feel about this story, but I've always wondered, what if the one woman hadn't spoken up to beg for the child not to be cut in half? Did Solomon really intend to cut the baby in half? Was he just pleasantly surprised that one woman spoke up, maybe relieved? I mean, I love you men, but the one thing I've learned in my lifetime in a patriarchal society is that powerful men in the patriarchy often fail upward. Even their mistakes are deemed as brilliant. Think Elon Musk. Could that have been what happened here with Solomon? I don't know. I guess I do believe that Solomon was imbued with God's divine wisdom. But I also believe there was someone else in that room who was gifted that same divine wisdom. And I'm not alone in my understanding. Theologian William Buchan asserted that this story is not actually just about Solomon's wisdom, but really about a woman who, by listening to her motherly instinct and trusting in her compassionate heart, helped the king to break through a legal impasse. Do you recall what I said a moment ago about the folklore motif concealing an emotional test? And that that is the actual heart of those folklore tales? The same motif applies here in the Solomon story, according to Buchan and other scholars. Buchan notes additional biblical stories which share the motif of the woman who influenced the king. Bathsheba, the woman of Tekoa in 2 Samuel. Solomon himself and his foreign wives who seduced him into idolatry. Buchan concludes that the true mother exemplifies the biblical character type of a wise woman. 
The story then, in its context, gives equal weight to the compassionate wisdom of the true mother and to the wisdom that guided Solomon. Solomon rendered a judgment, but justice for the child was not achieved until the woman declared what should be done by him. And as soon as she does, both she and the other woman disappear completely from the narrative. We never see or hear from them again. My point is this. Solomon rightly used his gifted wisdom to keep this child alive. But I wonder what happened next for these women and that child. I wonder if they returned to prostitution after their audience with the king. I wonder if the justice of that one room extended to their daily lives. I wonder if the mother had food and housing security as the boy grew. I wonder if they felt that justice had truly been served, or if they just went back to a life of desperation. Beloved, judgment without compassion is not justice. It is simply grandstanding. God's divine wisdom has been birthed in each of us, but it's useless if we don't marry it with God's divine compassion. This bizarre story of Solomon gives us an example of what it might look like when two come together. But let me give you an example of a story from modern day. A few years ago, a judge in upstate New York heard a case of an 18-year-old kid, really, who'd committed a string of petty burglaries and was facing a heap of trouble. As he stood before Judge Aaron Sadecki in court, the judge noticed that no one was present to stand or to sit with this young man. No family, no friends, nobody there to support this young man. Just a court-appointed criminal defense attorney who was hoping they could make a plea deal so he could get out of there. In the end, at the end of the proceedings, this young man was sentenced to two years probation and a load of fines to pay back what he'd stolen. And the judgment came down. Justice was rendered, right? But before that young man left the courthouse, he was summoned to the judge's chambers. And in the meeting with the judge, Judge Sadecki told the young man that he was interested in this case, particularly interested in this case, because the young man happened to have the same first and middle name as the judge's son, who had died in a car accident five years ago. Curtis Matthew. Sadecki took this as a sign from God that he was meant to know this young man. So that's what he did. Every month during that two-year probationary period, that judge took Curtis Matthew out for breakfast. And he listened as Curtis told his story, how he'd been abandoned to foster care, bounced around to dozens of houses, running, running away at 15 to escape an abusive situation, how he sold drugs for a little while just to make it through, how he was homeless for a period of time, how he dropped out of school when he was a freshman in high school. And the judge was moved with compassion for Curtis. As a result, he connected Curtis to a custodial job in the courthouse. He secured him a tutor so that he could try to get his GED. He befriended Curtis when he didn't have to, adopted him in a way. He showed compassionate wisdom when the judgment had already long since been handed down to achieve justice. Imagine Judge Sadecki's face when one day, years after he'd been pouring into Curtis's life, Curtis stood before him in his courtroom once again. Only this time, Curtis stood there as the defense attorney court appointed to another young man who was also in a heap of trouble. Justice is wisdom married to compassion. That, 
that is the heart of the story of Solomon. The beautiful love of this woman meeting the judgment of Solomon and together pouring out justice. It is a vision that sees the baby in Solomon as the key to understanding how those two components, wisdom and compassion, are required to achieve justice. To real, vulnerable people who are beloved creations of God. God, give us the divine wisdom of Solomon and the compassionate heart of that mother. Because only when those two come together will your justice pour down on this earth. For those who are shuffled aside to the margins, for those who are left behind powerless, give us the heart of King Solomon and that woman, the one woman.